Hey guys! Since I get a lot of questions on my YouTube channel and on my various social media platforms, I thought it would be a good idea to start doing some Q&A videos on the channel. Questions can be about anything, Baroque-specific topics, cello-specific topics, or just general things about being a musician. Or if you just want to know some more stuff about me, I'm happy to answer those questions too. I got a ton of great questions for this video. If you submitted questions, I may not be able to get to your question in this video, but I plan on making this a regular facet of my channel. First question is, what do you think of more modernized interpretations of Baroque music using vibrato and a modern bow? How do you feel about such interpretations being fed to students? So I don't inherently have anything against modern approaches, uh, so to speak. But I think the problem with a lot of modern and romantic approaches to Baroque music is that they miss a lot of what's exciting about this repertoire. The main issue is that the things that were expressive in the Baroque period are different than the things that became expressive in the Romantic period and onwards. So when we try to look at Baroque music as though it's by Brahms or even someone later than Brahms, um, we're going to miss a lot of the important details. In terms of using vibrato, there's nothing wrong with using vibrato as a way to add emphasis or add something special to a note. The problem with using vibrato all over every single note is that we actually lose a sense of what's important and everything gets really emphasized by the vibrato. I personally like to use vibrato on notes that I find particularly expressive, and those are typically harmonically strong notes. So typically that wouldn't mean putting vibrato on the resolution of a phrase, but more on the dominant or something before that. I think that it's okay to be expressive and go far with your interpretation of this music. If you feel connected to it and you feel uh, in tune with your interpretation, I think really any interpretation can be okay. The problem is missing some things that should be brought to life or trying to make the music into something that it isn't. One thing I see a lot with modern players is they try to make a long singing melody out of something that's actually multiple voices. We see this all the time in Baroque music. We have a solo part or one part that jumps a lot in register, and we're not supposed to elongate that into one line. For the most part, that's actually us playing multiple voices on the same instrument. If we can have that awareness, that's gonna change our articulation and change our phrasing and do something that's perhaps more historical, but also a little bit more interesting. I think modern players get hung up on Baroque playing because they're afraid it's going to be boring. But what we need to do if we love Baroque music and we want to perform it in a more authentic way is show modern players how expressive we can really be just using different tools. The long and short of it is everyone is free to make their own musical decisions. I think the most important thing is that we're playing with conviction in a way that we are connected to, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. Next question is, what is a typical day or week like for you? My schedule varies so much as a freelancer. Um, I do a lot of different projects, different times of year are busier than other times, so it fluctuates a lot for me. The most recurring thing that I have is teaching my private students, which I do all around the Boston area and all ages. So typically a few days a week during the week in the after school and evening hours, I'm driving around teaching private cello lessons. On top of that, I have my string quartet, emergence quartet, so if we're preparing for a concert, we're usually fitting in three to four hour rehearsals a couple times a week, depending on how close we are to the concert. Now that my YouTube channel keeps me pretty busy, I'm trying to film a video a week, which requires a little bit of planning and preparation every week. So I usually carve out a day that I don't have any lessons to teach to do my filming for my channel, and I usually spend that day doing a little bit of prep work and planning for the video as well. I'm always doing my social media stuff, so for me it's a part of my day every day to be on Instagram, Facebook, checking my YouTube stats, just staying on top of all of my different platforms and responding to comments and questions. Then it's always possible that I'll have a gig that may require a rehearsal or two beforehand, so that'll just come additional on top of the other stuff that I'm doing. So for me, it's a pretty consistent mix between teaching, filming for YouTube, rehearsing with a group or rehearsing for a gig, and then my own independent practice as well. Next question comes from a fellow cellist. Hi Emily, when I practice playing my cello, I'm conscious that my neighbor can hear me and in the past I've heard her complain. I want to know if you have the same problem and how you manage if you live in an apartment. So this is a really important issue, I think, for all musicians, especially if you live in the city and you likely are going to be living in an apartment building. And I have had to deal with this a lot living in Boston. Um, I try to get first floor apartments when I can, just because naturally the sound is going to carry much more to whoever's below you. Um, so when I can get a first floor apartment, I, that already gets rid of a lot of the issues um, with neighbors and such. 
After that, I make a point when moving into a new building to introduce myself to my neighbors, especially anybody who maybe shares a wall or if somebody is below me or above me and say, I'm a professional cello player. Um, I do practice my cello in the apartment. Um, it's not too loud, but um, you may hear it from time to time. I don't practice after 10 p.m. or before 9 a.m. Um, and then I usually give them my phone number in case there are any issues. Just letting people know that you are a professional, that you are gonna be you know, playing your instrument and doing that, I think already um, keeps them from getting frustrated if they hear the noise because they have an understanding of why they're hearing it. Though most people do not complain about the cello, it's a pretty mellow, nice sounding instrument for most people, um, so I haven't gotten really many complaints. Also, of course, if you are uh, above somebody, you will definitely wanna make sure that you have a rug on your floor. You know, Anything you can do to insulate the sound will go a long way. Next question. Does using a Baroque bow on a classical cello or a modern cello make any difference? Yes, it totally does. I think using a Baroque bow um, to sort of just get started with performance practice is a really great way to do it. You don't have to get a new instrument, you don't even have to worry about strings, but you can start working with a different tool that's gonna naturally give you a different aesthetic. I've done a lot of videos on bow technique and about the Baroque bow, so I'll link to a couple of those if you're curious in trying a Baroque bow, but I definitely recommend it if you want to just sort of start feeling out Baroque style and see if you like it. Next question. Are there any ensembles you like playing in aside from string quartets? Well, obviously I like string quartets because I have my quartet emergence quartet, um, but there are a lot of other ensembles that I really like to play in. Um, probably my favorite ensemble to be in is, I guess you could consider it a trio, but you don't really call it a trio, um, playing with a solo violin and a harpsichord. So that's typically the setup for a violin sonata because a cello and a harpsichord would make up a continuo section. I personally love playing continuo. Playing bass lines is everything to me. So when I get to accompany a higher pitched instrument, um, that's really what I like to do. I love playing with violin because we really do speak the same language. As string players, it's so much fun to really work on blend and articulation and sort of becoming one with your violinist. So for me, I could just play violin sonatas all day, obviously the continual part too, violin sonatas, but that's my favorite ensemble to be in. I also really like playing in string orchestras. Um, I love the repertoire like Concerto Grosso's by Handel and Corelli. Um, it's really fun to play in a big, powerful orchestra for stuff like that. And even though a huge symphony orchestra is not really my thing, I do love a small, um, sort of more intimate Baroque orchestra. Next question, do you practice every day of the week or do you take a break? And during the year, do you take any kind of holidays like one or two week vacations? So I have kind of unfortunate answers for both of these questions. Um, right now, with the way my schedule is, my practice, my personal practice, um, does not get as much attention as my other projects. Um, when I'm preparing for a big concert, a solo recital, or recording an album, practice really comes first. And in times like that, I try to get in three hours a day, um, six days a week, I'd say, out of the week. Um, but when I don't have anything like that on the horizon, um, I'm much more lax about practicing. I wouldn't recommend that if you're a student or you're um, really trying to work on and change your technique because in those cases, you really do need that recurring time. But in the professional world, sometimes life kind of takes over and you can't prioritize practice as much. I think that's fine for short term, but we always want to try to find a way to get back into a good practice rhythm. In terms of one or two week vacations, nope, never. Can't remember the last time I did that, unfortunately. Um, it's hard for me to even get a weekend off um, or you know, a long weekend, like getting three days. Um, it's just very rare for me to do that because I have so many different projects and so many different things that I'm trying to do. Um, so I usually just kind of have to fit that work in wherever I can. And it's just hard to really clear out the time. I think maybe around Christmas, I try to get maybe four days off if I can surrounding Christmas, but I do typically run a workshop that starts right on January 1st and I'm usually doing preparation for that. So yeah, I don't have vacations right now, um, but someday I hope that I will be able to take that time off. But right now I'm just busy with a lot of projects and so vacations take a back seat. But you know, two days off can really go a long way for relaxing, so I try to do that when I can fit it in. And the last question, which cities in the U.S. have great Baroque scenes? So I can only speak from my own personal experience. I live here in Boston, Massachusetts, which has a great early music scene and has for many, many years. 
Um, it's great that we have Boston Baroque, Handel and Haydn Society, big high profile ensembles that are playing on period instruments. So I think that really um, makes the early music scene thrive and we get a lot of other smaller concerts and chamber music just because there are so many people interested uh, in history here in Boston. San Francisco area also has a really great scene. I've gone out there before to play a lot of concerts. There's American Bach soloists and also Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra. So those groups also really spearhead the early music scene around San Francisco. I know there are a lot of emerging scenes as well, and I'm curious to learn more about these scenes and what they have going on. I know Philadelphia has early music like Tempesta de Mare is there. We're also starting to see more early music uh, in Seattle and Portland and that region. So the great thing is that early music is really starting to blow up all around the country. And I think that as more people play it and more people perform it and teach about it, there's going to be more scenes all throughout the country. Thanks so much for watching my Q&A video. If you have more questions to ask me, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll try to get to them on my next Q&A video. If you have anything you wanna to add to some of these questions, also feel free to chime in on the discussion. Thanks so much for watching. If you like these videos, be sure to subscribe to my channel. And if you wanna help support me make these videos, you can become my patron on Patreon.